Hello and welcome to another episode from China Teacher Brand, where I share with you what it is like to live and work in China. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you guys who has clicked the subscribe button. It's been an amazing week. From the 75% of the people who watch my videos without being subscribed, um, I have seen a drop in that percentage, and that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate the fact that you consider my content worth watching. And um, if you are an old subscriber, also welcome back. I really appreciate the fact that you guys have been supporting me for three years, and the new subscribers, well, it gives validity to the efforts that I've been making over the last three years. Thank you so much. Now, remember that if you want to support my channel, you can do it with the WeChat QR code that you see here or with the PayPal uh, link in the description down below. Today, we are going to talk about meritocracy and um, as a form of government here in China, and not just government, uh, uh, everything is based around merit here in China and in the West as well, but not as a form of government. And um, I also want to contrast it with the need for innovation and how it is at conflict with the way China uh, used to run. And we're going to talk about how they're trying to bridge those two um, apparently opposing concepts, okay? So without further ado, let us jump right into that topic. Um, I have to tell you um, a bit of a story of what I did last weekend. Last weekend, I received a phone call from uh, a friend of mine. His name is Dr. Zhang. Uh, you probably saw him in the video that I posted last last time about who is uh, China teacher brand. Uh, he's at the end of that um, show that they did on TV. That's him talking on that show about the work that we did together. Uh, Dr. Zhang is a scientist. He has a PhD in um, uh, Bot botanic studies. He's a botanist, I think. Uh, I'm not quite sure about what his degree is, but he's a very highly educated person. Um, in 2006, he was in charge of the Liverpool Communities Office uh, because a very important part was uh, what the, the city is doing for the environment. And after that, he had a stint in Beijing as a Vice Minister of Forestry, and for the last 10 years he has been working in a small city called Fan Cheng Gang uh, in Guangxi province, uh, running the planning department and the administrative department down there. So that tells you a little bit about the, the life of service uh, of a lot of the government officials. They they go where they're needed, they go where their expertise is required. It's kind of like the military in a certain sense. All right, so I was having breakfast with him and he gifted me uh, some uh, chrysanthemum tea and also a small little jar where you can keep the tea. In this jar there was a, a poem written by a um, a scholar uh, from some dynasty, I can't remember the dynasty. And the, the main story that Dr. Zhang was sharing with me is that this particular poet um, was writing mostly about how he never got to be confirmed as, a, as an aide or, or as a minister to the emperor um, after having passed all the different and rigorous uh, examinations required to become uh, an official in those days. Um, and that led us to talk about, yeah, well, how meritocracy is uh, a very long thing here in China in government. And um, we talked a little bit about, well, how that affects also uh, all kinds of uh, aspects of life here in China, like, for example, students and the Gao Kao, right? The Gao Kao, which is the high school living examination, and that determines so many things um, of the lives of students here. If you get a good Gao Kao, you get to a very good university, and that means that you're going to have a certain um, certain possibilities will be open to you because you got a good score in the Gao Kao. And the opposite is also true. So there's more challenges if you don't get to go to a, a very well-renowned university, etc., etc., etc. It's all meritocracy, right? Um, but then we started talking a little bit about, well, how it works in government, actually. And um, he mentioned that it is very difficult to become a high-level leader um, within the government here in China because um, when you become a leader, let's say a small leader, right, you need to learn to delegate. And as you start to delegate, you need to rely on the competence of your team. And, um, well, the higher you are in the echelons of government, the larger your teams are. He's talking from experience. He was a vice minister of forestry. And that makes it uh, a lot more difficult for you to rely or, or to, to keep control uh, on the competence of all the people that you are handling, that you are that you are leading. Yeah, 
in a, in a leading position like that. He also mentioned that um, because everything is merit based, there are KPIs, so to speak, like key performance indicators, and it's all about how you are affecting, how you are changing and improving the lives of uh, the people that, or, or the projects that affect the lives of the people um, that your department is in charge of. And uh, well, that's how how difficult it is because if if one of the cogs in in, in your machinery is weak and it breaks well heads would roll and that goes all the way up to the top so it's a uh, it's very important to to have a leadership style controlling um, how everybody's working together so they are all on the same page in terms of mission in terms of vision and and particularly in terms of methods somebody who works the way you do is very important for them to build large teams. So uh, as you can see uh, the government here is run almost like a corporation yeah like people have to perform or else they're out um, and uh, that's a that's an interesting contrast when you think about well a country like the United States where a person with zero experience in politics with many failures to his name like his bankruptcies and whatnot all the people will argue that those bankruptcies are just him using the tools at his disposal to make money um, but then it goes to to, to to display some of the values of uh, that type of leadership right you bring a company down so that you can make money that wouldn't fly here <laughs> in government I mean here in China bring your department down so that you can move forward no it doesn't happen like that but uh, the interesting thing is that from the early 2000s and um, during this particular project that I did in 2006 there was a lot of talk about shifting the the, the economy shifting the model uh, of China from a labor-intensive uh, economy to a uh, information or knowledge intensive technology and that was really interesting because when you think about the the road and belt project what they are trying to do is they're trying to build and develop well countries that need it and and that's basically labor intensive with the labor intensive economy you are building infrastructure you are building the country you are build, building things that will supply the basic needs and then you come in with the knowledge intensive with the technology intensive um, development of where you become a leader so first you build and then you lead so this change to innovation to research to development it's uh, a little bit at odds with uh, meritocracy itself because there is always room for trial and error in innovation I mean not room it is rooted in research and development you need to fail in order to succeed so how to balance those two things in, in, in a government like China where everything is based on well perform 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 and and failure uh, has consequences well they are doing something really interesting what they do is they the government detaches a little bit from all this research and development they will fund it they will sponsor it they will support it but it is actually done by private entities private companies I'm shooting this video here for example at NEO NEO is uh, an electric vehicle manufacturer and is the only car above 300,000 RMB that still receives a subsidy um, uh, for electric vehicles uh, so for example vehicles like Tesla they don't get the subsidy uh, Mercedes-Benz or Audi all those electric vehicles don't get why because NEO has a technology of battery swapping and is the only car that offers battery swapping at this price range so that's how they push for innovation and new technology and new new trends they don't they don't do it themselves as the government but they support uh, entities and private companies and private corporations that do so so 
as you can see, uh, for government, it's, it's, it's very difficult to embrace all this innovation, all this research and uh, technology that is rooted on <laughs> trial and error, basically failure, um, as is just opposed to their need to perform in order to uh, remain um, in their positions or to keep uh, climbing um, positions in, the, in government as officials. So it hasn't been easy for them to adjust and to and to change the mentality um, of the, the body as a whole to embrace the need for failure in order to lead the world. So it's been it's been interesting in these last two decades when they are kind of like satisfied with how they have built their country and now they're getting ready to start leading the world. And of course, we can go and list all the different examples of leadership in technology that is coming out of China nowadays. So to wrap up this video, um, I would like to mention two things that are extremely important. Number one, people tend to say that Chinese people don't talk about politics. Mm, that's not true. I just had breakfast with a member of government and he was willing to share some of these ideas and visions and, 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 and issues right, that they are sorting out with a foreigner like me. Um, it's just that they don't do it on social media. Somebody posted an extremely funny comment in one of my videos and he said like, um, it would be interesting to see Xi Jinping uh, running the country from WeChat the same way that Trump runs the country from Twitter. It would be interesting to see what Xi Jinping's moments are. Uh, of course he does. He doesn't do that. That's just not the way it works. That's not the way it should be, if you ask me. But anyway, uh, jokes aside. Um, it is also interesting to see how, as, as a country, they are willing to change, they are willing to modify centuries-old strategies of, of promoting uh, officials to embrace the new challenges, to embrace the new positions, to, to allow themselves the possibility to become the leaders in the world. You need to embrace innovation. And uh, talking to Dr. Zhang, he was talking, he was telling me that He's going to be retired, uh, retiring in a couple of uh, months, and his next project in life is to create a um, a pool of uh, like a mentorship, like a a pool of PhDs uh, that are going to put together a project to institutionalize research, development, and failure. As, as a natural way to evolve. He's a scientist after all. He wrote a, a book, uh, you can see right here, there's a picture, and um, this is his dedication, right? He wrote something for me when he gifted me the book as well. And uh, his approach is that even in nature, trial and error is, is, is an important part of evolution. A very Darwinian. Um, He's a scientist. I'm also quite Darwinian, if I if I must accept that, if I must uh, admit that. Um, so it's it's interesting to see what he's trying to achieve. He's trying to create a group of people who are going to create a new framework for China to allow other possibilities for education. When is that going to change? Of course, we don't know, but they are internally in within the government thinking there needs there needs to be room for other forms of performance for other forms of uh, measuring uh, success and and uh, improvement that is not just perform 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 we need to open our education very likely because we were talking about students with Dr. Dong and, and particularly my students and he offered to give some lecture to my students imagine that um, so yeah that's China for you that's how closed they are they're not closed at all they are very well aware of, of the challenges and where they're going what they need to do what they need to change but it's just done in a different way it's not done out in public opposition or um, different ideas are discussed uh, like you would discuss these uh, at a board meeting of a, of a fortune 500 company internally there's no tweets 
<laughs> there's no there's no voicing out there what's going on with the management of the company no they tackle it they figure it out and then they fix it and they put very smart people like dr dong in charge of developing these things um for the future of the country all right guys that's that's all the time we have for today thank you very much for watching this video and as always if you liked it give it a thumbs up and if you want to share it with people thank you uh my next goal is to be at 10,000 by the end of the month that couple of days i think it might happen so if you can help me i would really appreciate it. share this video too whoever wants to watch and whoever would benefit from this kind of information um, and um, also if you want to support my channel remember that the QR code is right here you can uh, scan it and um, well, send me your contribution via WeChat or if you are abroad you can use the link in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee using PayPal alright guys until I see you again take it easy and bye for now